Well, hello everyone. Um, all right, I'll do a quick survey first. Uh, who's here because they're interested in sleep apnea? A couple people, okay. Uh, who's here because they're interested in Arduino or programming? All right, that's more. <laughs> Very good. Um, how about uh, what goes wrong with electronics and when you have electronics so simple and there's not? Okay, a few. Very good. Um, and how about programming with XPs and wireless uh, between XPs and uh, PCs? Okay. And who's here because they already emailed they want to move from the room? <laughs> all right, they're all gone. Very good. All right. So um, I'll go very quickly on sleep apnea. Um, basically, it's when you stop breathing at night for a certain amount of time. Uh, believe it or not, you can stop breathing for 10 seconds. Some people can go 30, 60 seconds multiple times at night and they're actually not aware that they're doing it. But what happens is your brain eventually realizes, hey, there's no oxygen coming in and it wakes you up, at least it wakes your brain, you start you move, you change positions, and you start breathing again. That's all nice and good except for the fact that your average uh, oxygen in your blood is not so good when you do that and that your brain wakes up every time you do it. And it doesn't sound very natural, but actually this happens while you're sleeping. You don't actually consciously wake up. So your brain wakes up, but you don't. So in the morning, well, I guess you could, but typically you don't. So in the morning you wake up and like, hey, I slept eight hours and I feel like crap. And I don't even have children. What's going on? <laughs> or maybe you have children and they move out and say, I should be able to sleep now. What's going on? So that's the most common explanation for uh, this phenomenon. Um, the problem actually is that most people who have sleep apnea, up to 90%, if you believe, uh, percentages made on the internet that are made up on the spot, apparently, <laughs> uh, up to 90% of people will go undiagnosed. Since we don't know that they're diagnosed, we don't know that it's 90%. Right? <laughs> um, it's more for men than women, and they actually can cause, definitely uh, cost you some life years uh, just because they wear and carry out of your body and the fact that you're not sleeping properly every night on most nights. So again, your, your children move out eventually, the sleep apnea doesn't, it actually gets worse over time. So how do you find out you have sleep apnea? Um, if it's not your wife that's actually kicking you every time you wake her up because you're snoring too loudly, which is not necessarily the case, in my case I wasn't snoring, um, you do a, basically a sleep study. And the typical way is to go to the hospital where they have a bunch of probes that they put all over you. Right, it's a lot of fun, they shave your legs, they put things everywhere that you wouldn't want them to put stuff. And then, after about an hour and a half to two hours of prep, uh, they test all the equipment to make sure all the probes are working and they tell you good night. Um, if you try it, you realize it's not that easy to sleep with all that. In my case, actually, it's even worse because I like to fall asleep on my tummy, and if I have all that stuff on me with probes everywhere, like you show this the next picture, you're supposed to be sleeping with all that. Um, so as soon as you move, the whole thing tangles, it just doesn't work so well. But hey, well, I did that a few times, so to try it out and it confirms that if I sleep on my back, it's not good at all. So, so yeah, the other things, they cost a lot of money. It's the most expensive hotel room you'll ever go to, or at least hopefully, and it's not that comfortable. And the room service is not so good. So, the other option you have is uh, take-home sleep studies, which you can have. Um, some places actually offer those now. And it's a smaller version of that, works on batteries, you can take it home. It's not as intrusive. It's mostly designed to, to check a few signals, which is usually good enough. That would be perfect if you, would, uh, you, know, you could just take it home and test it for a week. But they actually cost a fair amount of money per night, so like three to five hundred dollars. And they're not meant for you to take home for a week. You really have to go back to the doctor every day to download the data and you recharge the battery. It's just kind of annoying. So it's not something you can just use over a week to see, hey, if I change this and I do three nights of this, three nights of that, what works best? And that's what I want. So, well, um, at least I've tried them. <laughs> This is one of them that you can tell is designed by an engineer. It has all the stuff that they need to get signals. Uh, it's perfect if you sleep on your back, but try to sleep on your side for 10 minutes with this and good luck. Uh, also, the, uh, the cannula that's on your face has to be very tight, otherwise it rips out when you move your face on the pillow. Uh, another option that's actually better designed, in my opinion, um, is actually better to get it. It goes all over your arm. You're more comfortable with that. And the sensors are interesting. Um, there's a, you probably have recognized the white, yeah, I can't really point it, but the, uh, the white thing that goes around your finger that you'll see in the hospitals, that the uh, SPO2 meter that checks your blood oxygen. Um, there's a little microphone that goes here to see if you're snoring. The little black box is actually just an accelerometer to see 
what body position you have. And uh, the blue one is the more interesting. Believe it or not, putting that on your finger they let you, they claim they can tell your brain activity to see what uh, stage you're in and can tell your breathing through your finger, which is kind of an impressive thing. So it's like, oh, okay, well, I guess I could maybe do something like that, right? It can't be that hard. Um, yes. What am I waiting for? Oh, ponder. Um, sure, I'm too most of the question. Thank you anyway, I'll have it just in case. So, I could read this for you. I'll let, let, me, let you read it to see how much fun it is. Uh, by the time you're done answering the reading this, you don't understand your question anymore. Uh, <laughs> which long story short is, okay, it's not that simple. We have a uh, lot of fancy uh, signal processing. Just the uh, log go to is actually very hard to get. Uh, the principle is actually not hard. They have, they have two diodes. One is, uh, two LEDs, sorry. One is red, one, one is infrared. Um, they can tell by going through your nail when your pulse comes through, it will change the color of your nail ever so slightly and change the amount of light that goes through your nail, which they capture on the other side. And by just using that very small change, they can tell that the blood is flowing every time your uh, heart is pumping. Now, on top of that, they have a derivative of that signal where if they use infrared, it goes, it bounces to different molecules uh, through your blood and it can actually tell how saturated it is with O2. Um, it's not that simple, and getting the signal processing on that is not that simple either. Uh, before I go into the, uh, the technical pieces, just very quickly, in case you're interested in the CPAP can you can read more of the talk. Uh, the typical cures are CPAP machine, which is typically something you have on your face that shows air into you. It works for a lot of people. For me, I just get tangled in the tube and choke myself at night. Or I rip the machine out of wherever it's sitting. Um, the next thing is a mouthpiece you can have, which actually is like a retainer, but it moves your jaw forward, so it actually opens the jaw here, and it's to have a bigger opening for breathing. Um, that's actually pretty convenient and works pretty well. It's easy to take with you, doesn't need batteries or anything like that. Uh, many surgery options, I'm not a professional, but they can take out your tonsils. In my case, they actually cut the jaw here and there and move everything forward for 1.5 centimeters, which is why I now have a bigger opening, and I can breathe a lot better. It's not much fun though, you drink uh, through a straw for six, uh, six weeks um, and you wire shut. But okay, well, you, you pay the price, I guess, for uh, not wanting to use CPAP machines. Um, and then the simpler thing, like this guy, which I will show uh, later, is simply something you wear on your back, so that when you sleep on your back, like, oh, and then you don't do it, so you don't sleep on your back. Well, I'll just back into the boot piece, because it's actually a, it sounds simple, but actually it was part of math for me. And go see a professional, please, on soon. All right, so back to the tech pieces. Um, like every good hacker, I had a solution, which was a, an Arduino board, and I had a few others. It's like, if I can't only could use this for something useful. Uh, this board I built at the next month for you, it was supposed to go into a rocket, but I'm just not as cool as the DL, and I have nothing to shoot it in the sky with. <laughs> um, and even it has a very nice GPS, too, I just never got to use it for what it was meant to be. And then I got those little guys. Um, so it's really just air in there. Uh, they also have ping pong ball sugar spread. Uh, the idea with this is I got a smaller version of that for my body size, put it in my back. And in the morning I was like, oh, my back hurts. What's going on? And obviously the point is I still sleep on my back with the thing, so I don't sleep any better, and then my back hurts like crap. So I'm like, all right, this is not so good. Uh, I talked to the vendor, and of course the whole point was, well, how much am I sleeping on my back at night? I have no idea. So, I was like, oh, well, maybe I do have an idea. I took the little, this little board, so it's about that big in real size, and I shoved it in there, um, and I'm using the accelerometer to store on the SD card which way it's facing all night. And then with that, I can know how long I was on my back. Pretty simple. So, after a little bit of processing and so forth, I get something like that. It is readable, very good. Um, and I can see it throughout the night. The time is actually not correct. But it, the clock wasn't set properly on the device, but it just uh, shows you through the night, slipping from left to right to down and so forth. So on this one, I actually figured out that if I were two of these guys with bigger pads, one top, one the bottom, it would finally stop me from sleeping on my back. And you can see facing up is 0%. Uh, so by that time, I got it working. That was 
I'll save it a couple of months that it took me to get there. <laughs> All right, so I had this. I think I got something with the board. I was happy, but well, you know, I never, never leave well enough alone, as they say. So hey, this thing takes XP radio. So obviously, why am I downloading, downloading this on the SD card every morning when I can just stream it to my computer and use my light user? And actually, it makes sense. It's a very small SD card. It's hard to get out. I have to take the device out from there. It's not really well secured, so it was nice to leave it inside and get the data automatically. So very quickly on the uh, XP radio, so some people had interest in that. Um, they look like this. They're real size, slightly bigger than the size of my thumb. Uh, they cost, cost 30 to 50 bucks. Um, they have different uh, series, series one, series two, or 2.5 now is uh, the point one in the mesh networking wire versions of that are not compatible, so you have to pick the right one. I would personally recommend the 2, 2.5 now, just because you can have multiple ones in your house, and you can use them to automatically relay a signal that's too weak if the computer is not next to where you're broadcasting from. Uh, then you have different kinds of modules. You have the pro modules that cost slightly more. They use more battery, but they can send a signal a lot farther. Um, they use only 3.3 volts or even less. And they're obviously perfect for Arduinos, which is why the, uh, most Arduinos will use those <coughs> as a default uh, transmitter. On the PC side, you use the exact same radio, and then you have a little uh, PC uh, UART uh, USB converter, and then you can just read as a serial port, and you just, you, just, you just get ASCII data on your PC like an old style modem, and it's very easy to just uh, log that. So that was uh, working a little bit, and then one morning I started running into a random garbage on my PC, and I'm like, hmm, it's good on the SD card, and by the time I receive it, it's all bad. So you go through all the radio stuff, I might be anyone transmitting on the same frequency and so forth, not finding any explanation. So now, you know, I'm a computer guy, I'm not really into electronics much, so it, it was definitely an interesting learning curve. Um, I have this very tiny uh, oscilloscope uh, in the corner, and this guy is also a logic analyzer, so I was able to put it on the pins of my XB and get the signal from it to see what I was actually sending to the XB to make sure the signal was correct. And what was it very interesting, I know it's too small to read, but I was actually getting ASCII that was correct. I, I, I could see my data being sent, but by the time I was on my server, I wasn't receiving it. And because it has two channels, I was starting to see two different pins, and I realized, hey, when I put on the other pin, it doesn't work anymore, I'm getting garbage too. So I was like, hmm. And I talked to the guy, uh, Gabriel, who's a guy who open source that little uh, 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 oscilloscope mm -hmm. logic analyzer. He sells them for like 40 bucks. They're really a great party. Um, and he answers emails, and he's super helpful. And he said, hey, you know, on one pin I do software decoding, and other one I do hardware decoding. It probably is a timing issue. And long story short, I got a new GCC, which was just a little bit faster and made everything just a little bit too fast so that the XB wasn't able to pick up the signal anymore. So it was seeing my proper signal as garbage and it was sending garbage on the other side. So okay, great. That was a potential trend. So back to having uh, my data being sent. Now it was all nice and good. But hey, well, position wasn't good enough. I wanted to also know if I could still stop reading at night. I mean, I'm doing a lot better now, but you know, how good is it really working? And I thought, well, well, maybe I can take one of those little uh, finger probes that you can get in hospital. You can buy them online for 20 bucks. Uh, even though technically you're not supposed to buy them as a patient, if it's a medical device, God forbid. Um, and I found out that actually they're really hard to interface with. Um, it's very easy to use the LEDs to light them up, uh, but just to make your life difficult, they, even though they have seven pins, they use the same two pins and they reverse the voltage on them. Uh, this one is the infrared, and the trick is to use a camera, because the camera will actually see the infrared when you eye it or not. That's the only way to know that it actually works. <laughs> uh, and that's the red LED, which is not easy to, to see. On the other side, you actually see the phototransistor that's supposed to receive the signal. And uh, in four way, it was, since it's not meant to be used by other people, it's meant to be used with a multi thousand dollar device, I was never able to get a usable signal out of it. So I've seen people who did their own, where they bought their own components. But by that point, you don't have something nice, simple, and disposable anymore. So I spent a fair amount of time on that, and then I realized it was a losing battle. So I called this guy instead. Um, this one's actually fully contained. Uh, it's those 
uh, it has the batteries, it even has USB out and Bluetooth. So that's not like a great deal. Um, you can see how it's computing 98% um, uh, O2 and then the output at 89. And you can even see little pros going on. It's, it's actually well designed. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm saved. This is just what I need. But not so much. Um, turns out it's using Bluetooth, but their, their, cast, it's, their stack is so bad that it barely works with Windows. I use multiple machines and it only works with one of them. Never mind the Linux code, which they have no drivers. Um, and writing my own, once I start looking into it, people say, I was sitting in an edit Bluetooth programming, and now my hair fell out, my wife left, and <laughs> please don't do it. So, okay, I took that advice. Um, the USB piece, yeah, same thing. You couldn't talk to it easily without their non published uh, driver. And there's a few, a few very smart people here that don't get stuck by that, and they will just do protocol analysis on Windows, but I was like, oh, uh, maybe not. Um, but I was able to actually get data on some data on Windows and to see how it worked. Um, you can only get a graph, actually. They will not even be nice enough so that you get a lot of data from it. Uh, but you can see at the, uh, the one mark at one morning, how uh, the uh, O2 goes down, and even though it's not showing breathing, you can see the uh, pulse going up, which is the body waking up and say, oh, something is wrong. And then you breathe again and you start uh, going back to normal. So that's how it's supposed to work, just that it wasn't usable for my project. So I went back to, okay, let's do more hacking. Um, I was about to, I was getting a bit tired of changing the batteries on my device all the time. I was happy to just leave it in there and use it for a whole week. And I figured out the XD radio can be turned off when I'm not transmitting. So every five seconds I send uh, a bunch of data and then I turn it off. And that can be done by just sending a signal to one of these pins with the Arduino. And that way I was able to save batteries. Uh, this is meant, by the way, to have links that if you're interested in doing yourself, you can read there. Otherwise, we'll be here for multiple hours. So, okay, SPO2 wasn't working. Um, I still, I just want to know my breathing pattern. After all, I don't really care what my saturation is so much. I want to know if I start breathing for how long. So, if you want to do that, well, the typical way is, of course, to use a cannula. Um, so, you can buy those little guys. I got that, I think, a pack of 20 again. Uh, from Amazon, I think they were 20 or 30 bucks. It is a medical device, I'm not supposed to buy this for my own use because I might poke myself through or something. <laughs> but anyway, um, they take your money and they send you a box. Um, so it kind of works. Uh, actually, yeah, it's on the other side. I have a picture of next, uh, the next slide. I'm going to show you slightly better what it looks like. And I found those little uh, wind uh, sensors. There's, it's, it's covered with tape because I'm actually having a sensor go through it. Uh, but just to show you the side, it's not very big. And it's a very ingenious device. It's, it's designed for Arduinos and other microcontrollers. It has two little pins. One is actually just to measure the temperature in the room that you're in to have a baseline. The other one is a uh, little resistance that is heating up with power. So it's creating heat and it's measuring the heat that's created by it. And if you blow wind through it, it will actually cool down that resistance. And by just measuring the cooling down, they can guess how much wind goes through it. And it's amazing enough that I actually was able, by putting a tube onto it, to have enough air go through the tube to detect uh, breathing. It wasn't perfect, it has to be taped, it's based on temperature, but hey, you know, it actually works. So, <laughs> I, I don't have to write too many jokes, by the way, I'm just putting pictures of myself where all that crap is funny enough. Um, so, this is what it looks like. <laughs> It's not duct like tape, thank you for asking. Um, I still like to shave and not just rip out all the hair. But um, the cannula, um, the problem for me again is it got ripped out. Because I am my head on the pillow, I do this, and then the thing just comes out. I actually get loosened up and then it comes out of the nose. So I have to be tight, put tape. Then we'll see next slide. Uh, I have two little black things here. Uh, the zero probes, so those actually pick up your brain uh, waves and they can actually see if you're sleeping in what state of sleep you're in. Uh, they're actually pretty cool. And the reason why I have two is because one of them goes to a bed uh, side clock, which I can talk to. The other one goes to my phone, which is the same device but doesn't work like the first one, so it can upload automatically to their website. And at the time I was trying to to see if they were giving the same signal. And I was just too lazy to take the SD card from the first one that uploaded the stuff every day. That's why I was wearing both at the time. The same thing, you have to use tape, otherwise I move and then it stops working. 
So that's the uh, Zero Bedside Sleep Manager. It's about uh, 150 bucks or so. Um, it is partially meant to just know how long you're sleeping, what sleep stage you're in, and it gives you a sleep score every night based on each uh, sleep cycle you were and how long you were in each. So here you're seeing 73 for the night. Um, their thing is they give you a score and then you try to see if you sleep with earplugs, with the light blocked, if you don't drink alcohol before going to bed, or don't touch caffeine after two in the afternoon, how it affects your sleep. Um, it's kind of a crude instrument. I wish they really did a lot more than it did. But they have the right idea that you can't just measure sleep one night. You want to measure it over a whole week. Do the same thing for a week, get an average number, and then next week you try something else and you measure that number. It's just a number they have, in my opinion, is not based on enough, uh, enough things. But the point is, they, they have the right idea. And then what they did that was really cool is they said, hey, you bought the device, you have data, how about we let you use it? What a concept. Thank you, thank you. Everyone did that with me much later on. So they actually had a little plug in the back of the device, and uh, it's at the bottom, and they show you how to connect those things using your simple USB serial cable, um, and then they give you a code that you can use to read the data from it. That was very nice of them. I noticed it's a bit flat, it's not too small. Um, so you, I get a string of uh, AF airflow, I get a string of digits, and then I can turn that off into um, a breathing sample that we'll see later. But the line I want to show with the last one is the zero sleep state. Every five minutes it tells me what sleep state I'm in. And that comes from that device and it's logged directly on my computer. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the details that comes from the Arduino. You can read that later if you're interested in it. And once, um, once I have the airflow uh, from the cannula, I can then just read that. Uh, I'm using 10 verse and then graph it. So when you hear graphing on the next time, one says, oh, it's easy, I'll just use Nucleot. Except Nucleot actually doesn't do sub-second uh, data, it only does up to once per second, and so one sticks with them. But I found that Grace with an X and Grace interface, which does that just fine, and all I had to do was just make a special time format for them, um, and then put a dot one, dot two for the uh, 100 millisecond interval here, and then the airflow value that I have for each of them. And by just transforming the data into that format, I can make a nice graph and see what's going on. So this is just to show you overnight uh, what's going on. So what's interesting is you see it going down like that. That's actually because it's temperature based. So as the room gets colder, the heating element gives you different results. But I don't care about it as much as how much of up and down it goes. And that's what I get here. So it works pretty well. The peaks are actually quite nice. Um, you can't see too much of this graph. I spent a long time looking at all the different pieces of the graph. What's interesting is depending on how good the connection is between my nose, the air, and the uh, heating element, I can actually see the inhale from the exhale, which are different peaks. So it was kind of tricky to get those. Um, here I took an example showing that it's not all nice and good because I think my breath was here, there, and there, and I think those peaks are maybe the exhale of bad data. But then I figured out, you know what? I don't really care if I have extra breath flow. I care if I have nothing. So that was not so bad. And it was usable, um, mostly. Then I found out, oh, well, I sleep on the tube, or do, I don't know what I was doing at 2.39 in the morning, but obviously I blocked the tube somehow. So that would show that I wasn't breathing. Uh, I'm pretty sure that I didn't stop breathing <coughs> for two minutes, or whatever long that was. So that means that I can't really be long on that. Uh, to know that I'm not breathing or not. But it was a nice idea at the time, and I almost thought I had it. Um, all right, so back, back to the drawing board. Um, so that, that thing was nice, but because it heats up a uh, resistor, um, it's just using too much battery power every night. Um, the tube had kept moving, so I had to tape it, and so forth. So I don't want to get uh, too far behind. So, okay, what else can I do? My second thought was, what if I had a stretching sensor or some kind of something around my weight, which is the other logical thing. The obvious problem is if you're moving, you're going to be stretching that while you're moving in bed, but you don't move all night. So I figured it was worth a shot. Uh, first, I found a little uh, elastic band. And let's see, it looks like this guy. It's all black, so you can't really tell one from another. But this little guy here is what stretches and changes resistance. I used the heart rate monitor just to hold the band so that it was convenient to put it on me. 
and it worked on the bench, it just didn't work when I was sleeping because it wasn't being stretched enough and I couldn't really see any breathing. Also the feet are showing that I have noise in there, so that I had a few problems to solve. So then I looked at other options, I found some conductive fabric and that actually uh, worked better. Uh, you can see the two different kinds here, uh, the real size, this is what it looks like, actually. I wanted to this guy. And that's actually what I've been using more recently. And it doesn't stretch a lot, but you don't actually need a lot. You only stretch it by a couple centimeters, really, at most, if, if that. And that was actually working, um, but I had a problem where the resistance of this guy was a little bit too high. So the Arduino, when you're measuring a very high resistance, you have impedance problems. Um, so I have, I'll put this very quickly for the electronics, if you're interested. Um, you use basically a voltage divider, which is showing um, you have voltage between the VCC and ground. You put your Arduino in the middle. This is a resistance that doesn't change. And that's the one that's the stretch band. And when the, the sum of those two is too high, it takes too long for the current to go through the resistance to the Arduino. And when the Arduino is sampling, it doesn't get a good enough sample. And the way to solve that, I found out, was to put a capacitor here, which gives you quicker current to the Arduino. So even though you're sampling very quickly, you're getting a sample that's good enough. So they made it better. Um, the zoom, is, uh, this is actually usable breadth here, but you can see I have big peaks going down, which obviously are also bad data. So yet more problems of noise uh, and analog electronics. And why am I not getting the next page? Because Okay, what is it doing now? Yes. I'm is it not giving my next page? I actually don't have it full screen because of how oh I can reuse this guy. This will work, yes. Okay. Sorry about that. So uh, yes. <laughs> um, I had noise, so I was like, okay, let's see what's wrong. And just when I'm about to go to bed, I start doing all the calibration. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what the hell are you doing? It's too late. <laughs> okay, so yeah, okay. Anyway, um, eventually, long story short, I figured out, okay, let's just put more capacitors. Uh, if this is not big enough, I have this bag right here. Uh, but maybe it's not very practical for size. Eventually, I found out, though, that the problem was um, the XB was actually robbing too much current uh, from the voltage regulator, and I'll just skip quickly. Um, oh yeah, before I'm getting ahead, sorry. I actually thought, hey, my impedance is too, too high. The spec sheet says you can only have 10 kilo ohms. So I tried to bring down the resistance, and I built a longer band. Uh, there was two purposes. It's actually a triple band. I, I actually bent it three times, so you can divide the resistance by three. And the thought was, if I go all the way around my body, even if I sleep on one side of it, it's still going to move somewhere. That's why I made a longer one. Um, the problem with this, so it, it fixed the resistance problem because it was so long. It wasn't actually uh, detecting enough of small movements. So now I wasn't really getting much of a usable curve. It was more like the uh, other elastic band I had before. That was one step back. Um, so I went back with the uh, cold meter and the bed and all that kind of stuff, and I eventually found out, hey, you know, when my batteries are full, it works a lot better. And those batteries go down very quickly initially, and then they even off for a while. And I found out, hey, I had a, before the regulator, I had a diode to protect from reverse voltage, and the diode is robbing just enough voltage, that I'm getting into a piece where the regulator isn't working so well anymore with that voltage. It works, but just enough that when the XP is transmitting, it dips the voltage a little bit, just the time the ADC is working, and that's why it's giving me that noise, because whatever it's measuring, the voltage is moving what is being measured, and that's why I was getting those little dips. So what I did after that is I said, okay, I just put the band somewhere, I didn't touch it, and I measured it over time, just so that I would have something that looked as close to a line. And you can see here, it's going up and down, there's still a bit of noise. And I did the test with uh, the XB Pro, which is the top one, a regular XB and no XB at all. And it turns out if I have no XB, it's the line's almost perfect. And the fact that it goes up and down one dot is okay, and that's, that's acceptable noise. Um, and when I have the XB Pro, which is sending with a lot of strength, it's dipping the voltage and causing those problems. 
So that's for the electronic front. Okay. There we go. So um, that was for electronics <laughs> to make the life more interesting. Um, for now, I'm just getting back to using the SD card if I want to get proper data without any noise. I'm still trying to filter all, all the noise if I use a, prop, uh, a strong uh, sending XP, but at least I have something I can use for testing. And this is the data I get at the end. So I get that on my Linux uh, PC, and I want to parse that to see what my breadth are. Um, it looks easy when you look at the naked eye, but if you do peak detection, for instance here, you have three different peaks. So you have to know that a breadth can be X milliseconds or seconds, and look on each side to decide, oh, okay, this is bigger than the one before, than the 110 before, than the 120 before, and you do after two, and it gives you a good idea of what the peak is. Then when you have interesting things like this, um, you can see the amplitude being very different. I found out that when I'm on my, uh, that was on my tummy, because I'm partially blocking the bell from changing, the amplitude I get is not very high. It's still enough to get breathing. And here, obviously, I moved at night, which I know from here, Arduino accelerator, and here I get much bigger amplitudes. But if you want to use any kind of formula which works on this guy on the left, once you get here, the formula doesn't work as well. So peak detection can be interesting. But that's something mostly working. And then at the, end, at the end of the day, this is what I get. I know how many times I moved at night, like just like before. But now I know how many times I had peaks which are breadth. And I can calculate the distance between each peak and keep track of the ones that were the longest apart from the previous one. And this one tells me my biggest difference between two breadth is eight seconds, which is quite acceptable. So uh, here you have the, the things from different uh, places and people who help me. Uh, at a food, if you know the electronics, they have lots of uh, nice toys and information that you can uh, use. Um, Eonix is actually the company that has that stretch fabric, which they're currently not selling yet. Uh, they have lots of different things they're using, but uh, they gave me a sample of that, and that's what I've been using, and it's been working quite well for me. Um, the next one is uh, Cozio for providing programming information, uh, which I wish more people would do. And the people from LinuxConf, they you from down under, who actually uh, were evil enough to get me to Arduino, so I was a perfectly happy camper with computers before. <laughs> so uh, we have a little bit of time for a demo. So this is a serial monitor. I'm going to plug it to my board here. So I'm not going to sleep for you, but we'll be done. <laughs> that shows the board putting up. It's trying to send data to my server, which it's not finding, so it's takes very far from here. And the one that's plugged in is this guy. So right now it's showing me that the board is pointing up. So if I turn it upside down, it should be pointing down on the next sample, hopefully. There you go, down. And then the breathing samples, we'll try these guys. I'm going to try to put it in front of the next. Really but if I pull on it quite a bit, I'm not going to hold my breath by talking, but all the way down to zero, basically, which is more than I would get from regular breathing. And then when I breathe, it will get back to higher values. So then I take that data, it goes into um, my breath and heat detector. And at the end of the night, I get something like this. So here you can tell the, the position changes. And I can zoom when I see, hey, I didn't breathe at this time for eight seconds. I can go zoom on it and look at what happened. And see whether it's bad data, whether it's actually me that changed position, or if I stop breathing. Also, I may have issues where the amplitude is not very high because I'm still trying to find the perfect band or like, how the hell do you do peak detection on this guy? Uh, but the idea is, you know, I have enough that I can tell that there's activity, which is really what I care about. 
Um, so I have a little bit of time left for questions and uh, things on whether you care about Arduinos, XBs, you tell me what's more interesting to you and I'll spend the rest of the time with that. Did you uh, try to cannula the stretchable fabric at the same time to try and um, check for breaths? I did not. I could. Um, I told you one thing I had on the slide, which I didn't mention, is I first used this because it was the obvious thing to do, but I just wasn't very happy wearing that at night, to be honest. The second thing that was on the slide, I didn't go into detail, is when you're breathing, you actually put water vapor in there which is basically a cesspool of water that becomes and grows and things start walking out of it eventually. <laughs> so the point is you have to clean it with alcohol and so forth. And I didn't find myself wanting to use this long term. It was just my first uh, test. Um, and because it was also killing the batteries at the same time, once I got the stretch sensors working to the point that I knew I could do something useful with them, I kind of abandoned this. Because um, I want something as simple and unintuitive as possible. And this just wasn't it. And I think it works better for people to sleep on their back. On their back. I just know I'm the opposite. And in my view, it's a good thing. If you have sleep apnea, you actually don't want to be sleeping on your back. So uh, that was the, the thing I had uh, quickly put on the slide on uh, sleep studies, is that not only you have all this crap on you, but they force you to sleep on your back because that's how their monitoring works. And even have a camera looking at you at night that detects movement and things like that. And the mere point of you being measured is actually what's making your sleep worse. And then they say, hey, guess what? You have sleep apnea. Let's sell you a machine and all kinds of things. But half of it, they created that with their machines when they were measuring it. So I wanted to have something that I was happy having and it would be causing not only half an hour of setup before and after, but that was as intrusive as possible. So I do wear this guy. These actually help me as opposed to getting in the way. Other question? Yes? Have you stopped this? Uh, detecting your breathing with a microphone in place near your nose. So they have that. It works for snoring. For breathing, there's not much noise. I mean, if you listen to someone sleeping, it's a very small noise. And you, you have to breathe right under your nose. Sure, you could. You could. Um, so now you get into single. And you're against the pillow. Well, <laughs> You could still do it, right? But you get into single processing of deciding what's the wind noise versus what's the noise in the room. The cat outside the door saying that maybe it's time to feed it. I sleep with airplanes, so I don't have to hear it. Um, and it's just, it's, it was more complicated. Uh, and it's a good idea. It works very well for snoring. For breathing, I think it's complicated. Anyone else? Five minutes. Yeah, I know, that's fine. Yes. What is the, the stretch fabric actually mm -hmm. meant? Is it very resistant? That's a good question. Um, those guys are not, it is very variable resistance. Um, let's see, this guy, when it's unstretched, it's about, I think, um, this length is about 50 kilo ohms. And when I stretch it, it goes to 25. So you can basically divide by two. Uh, if you ask me how they do it, that I don't know, because they didn't tell me. I think it actually maybe, I don't know if it's a straight secret, but they just don't, yeah, they don't tell you what it is. Um, I found another one from a company called SEMF that was on the slides, um, which has some kind of weaving, uh, I don't know what kind of metal they use, uh, but it was just too conductive, I was only getting five ohms out of it, and that was just too high to take it too much current, so that's not very battery friendly. Um, so the answer is, I don't quite know what they put it in, but definitely if you just put a ohm meter on it and you stretch it, uh, it's quite easy to see the difference in uh, the systems. And that's what the voltage divider does. Um, then it changes the voltage between those two points, and that's what the Arduino can uh, detect. Anyone else? No? Yes? Uh, what's the best way to test the stretch fabric? 